Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I think it's time we start. Uh, thanks to everyone that showed up today. Uh, thank you to everyone that attended uh, last week and are here again this week. And uh, welcome to all the newcomers. Uh, today we delve into week two of our five-week um, Wellness RX lecture series. I'd like to thank um, the Surge Kuwait for this awesome opportunity they've given me. And uh, I'd like to introduce our two guests tonight. So we have, um, this is an order in which they'll present tonight. So we have Vicente Baltran, who holds a bachelor's degree in physical education and sports science. He currently works as a coaching facilitator for the ASICS World Triathlon team, as well as being a team coach at World Triathlon. He's a certified level two swim coach, as well as a certified level three triathlon coach. Uh, our second guest this evening is Dr. Thomas Brownlee, uh, who is a UK-based sports scientist with 10 years of experience working within elite sports. Uh, Tom conducted his PhD uh, looking at strength training in, a so in soccer players while working for the Liverpool Football Club. Uh, Tom is currently a lecturer uh, and con continually has um, consultancy roles within sport uh, with companies such as the English Premier League, Formula One, NFL and Adidas. Uh, as he's doing today, Tom also speaks internationally about his experiences and his current work and research. Uh, I'll hand over the time to Mr. Vicente. Uh, thank you so much and uh, good luck. Thank you, Osama. So let me just play that. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, for me, being delivering this session remotely in Kuwait, it's like being uh, at home <laughs> because uh, I spent some of my career uh, over there working at the Cornish Club and also with the, with the Triathlon uh, Federation. And I'm still highly involved with the sport in the country. So to me, it's like being, being at home. So um, I'll try to share with you some information about uh, different ways to stay active through endurance sports since uh, it's my field of expertise, um, triathlon and its disciplines, swing, bike, run, for those that are not familiar with the sport. I'll try to share uh, different ways of uh, how you could stay active and, and, and be healthy through the, pra uh, the practice of the, uh, these five, sorry, four sports actually. Okay. So um, there are a lot of evidence that um, have proven the positive effects of, uh, of exercise in health and uh, um, you know, the, this short and long-term benefits. And it's, as you can see there on the screen, there are many diseases that can be, um, can be prevented, such as cardiovascular diseases, uh, diabetes, cancer, hypertension, or obesity, depression and osteoporosis, and premature death. Um, as a great and, and the particular weather we, uh, you have there, it's difficult to exercise outdoors for majority of, of, the, of the year because, uh, well, when I live there, you can basically enjoy the weather for half of the year, but the rest is a little bit more complicated, although there are many ways to exercise and to practice sport, no matter, no matter the, uh, the weather. So uh, we also have a huge problem with, the, with diabetes there due to the sedentarism in um, nutritional habits and um, well, I'm, I'm quite proud of uh, how the, the situation has uh, changed since the first time I landed there in 2012 because obviously it has improved. Nowadays you can see a lot of people riding uh, outdoors, uh, running many places where you can you can swim, when you can practice uh, outdoor activities and um, I believe Step by step, the, the habits of, uh, of the sport habits of the populations uh, of the population are slightly changing. And well, obviously that will have a direct impact on the lifespan of of the Kuwaitis because compared to some of the countries in Europe, uh, is is pretty pretty low. And um, I think uh, there's no doubt through the practice of physical activity those uh, situations can be can be reverted and we can extend the lifespan of the, the Kuwaitis through the, the practice of a sport. Since, uh, well, triathlon is, as I say, is my, my main sport, although I also uh, coach 
at least from different different uh, disciplines, I'll focus on those ones. But before we move into this context, um, there are five key components that uh, take part of, of having a healthy lifestyle. And one is the control of the body weight. Obviously, um, ob obesity is something that uh, affects uh, our health in a negative way and can be managed in, in, in different ways. But uh, obviously through a balanced diet, it uh, could be you know, one strategy that we could implement to have this control of, uh, of uh, our body weight, as well as uh, exercising, uh, obviously. We know um, the society and the way well, the, the, the life has been structured in great. It's slightly dif difficult because uh, even if you want to walk, it's pretty complicated to, to do it safely in uh, you know, the entire city. So there are areas where okay, you can run, you can, you can walk with no problems. Like you know, I used to live close to Gold Road and that was, uh, yeah, to me, was my, my favorite play playground there. But we know it's uh, a little bit difficult. We all go everywhere by, by car because the public transportation is not uh, well developed and, and therefore it forces us to, to take our car and also the bike is not, it's not safe. But as long as we can uh, avoid taking the car, then um, that should be one, uh, one action that uh, will definitely help you know, uh, reducing or dropping our body weight. Then uh, the practice of regular physical activity is also key uh, in order to maintain a healthy lifestyle. And uh, there are many options in the, in the country to do it. So do we, you don't necessarily need to stick to one discipline because especially nowadays, there are uh, many things you can, you can do in great uh, water sports, um, endurance sports, as the one I mentioned before. We have, uh, there are many different gyms with the top class facilities which uh, are offering a wide range of activities and exercises for, for people to just enjoy uh, exercising. But the cheapest one and the one that we all have at, at our reach is uh, to put a pair of running shoes on and go out for a, for a jog or for a walk. That's uh, something that everybody can, can do or even skating. Uh, I think it's a, a, the area that close to Marina. It's, it's perfect uh, for practicing um, this sport. And obviously, uh, the sleep, uh, having a good ha sleep habits are key for healthy lifestyle. But I think Tom will take us uh, through that later when it comes to high performance or, or performance itself, no matter uh, what, what your level is. A lack of uh, sleep or sleep uh, deprivation has negative effects in all the hormone, uh, hormonal uh, reactions happening in the, in the body. So keeping a huge a uh, nice uh, and controlled sleep habit um, definitely helps uh, maintaining our, our health. And uh, last but not least, the, the management of stress, stress management. Uh, it's obviously that having a, a life with, the, with a lot of uh, stress also creates some, uh, some side effects to our health. And the way you handle it is, uh, is key to uh, maintain this healthy lifestyle. Then, um, as I mentioned, uh, there are many benefits associated with the practice of, uh, of endurance training. And well, for those that are not familiar with the term, we could define the, the endurance training as the act of exercising in a way that uh, increases the body's ability to withstand with, uh, with the demands of, of the activity itself for long periods of time. So actually it's opposite to um, the anaerobic systems that uh, will be more um, um, more related to sports such as uh, uh, football or, or, or tennis. So, uh, so based on the current research, we know that practicing uh, endurance uh, exercises or sports such as uh, the ones I already mentioned, triathlon, swimming, running, cycling, so they have uh, direct benefits in uh, anti-aging, although when, uh, when you practice it in a more professional way, I wouldn't say it has this, uh, this, uh, the same benefits. But from, from a recreational point of view, definitely 
uh, there are many, many, many benefits uh, associated with the with the, uh, the practice of endurance training. So it's something that um, I obviously highly recommend for for uh, adopting a healthy lifestyle. It has also a direct impact on the growth in the bone density, and that's especially key for women, especially for those that uh, only swim, because uh, if if you are only swimming, then um, there is not any impact that creates or enhances the uh, formation or the build of new, new uh, cells in the bone. So it's, uh, if swimming is your fi favorite sport, then you should introduce uh, some um, high impact exercises like running or jumping or, or things that actually provoke any stress in your bones. Otherwise, uh, the, the the growth, uh, sorry, the bone density will be as uh, affected, and um, you can you be likely to suffer uh, osteoporosis in, in in the coming years. Also helps to develop the immune system, and um, and that's key for not getting sick, and also have uh, some direct. Bene uh, benefit uh, fighting or preventing uh, uh, diabetes uh, so because it helps regulating the, uh, the insulin, insulin production and, and uh, obviously it's uh, something for a country like uh, Kuwait that we would like to focus on. Um, I will also would like to highlight the importance of socializing when practicing this kind of sports because Okay, running is something you can do with uh, with your with your friends, with your partner, as well as going out with the with the bike. It's a good way for socializing while practicing exercises, especially if you are doing those at an intensity that allows you to to talk. If you are training at such an intensity, then uh, you make sure that you are used to utilizing your aerobic system, uh, which will help. You will help you burning fat and, and or using the fat as a main source of energy, and therefore will help also controlling the uh, the body weight. Okay. Um, there are many many other benefits associated, especially socially ones. Yeah, uh, I'm in Spain, and every time we go out for uh, for a bike ride, there is a stop in a coffee bar after that for for breakfast. So it's uh, yeah. It's something that I enjoy even more, even more than going out on the bike. And for those who, who have um, jobs that requires to be uh, focused and a lot of time uh, sat on chairs, uh, walking or, or running for <clears throat> no longer than well, or like for 20 minutes, as you can see on the, uh, on the picture there, um, improve the cognitive function and then uh, make us be more productive. Now with the COVID that everybody has moved to, um, uh, to this kind of, uh, of, of work or environments like me, I used to be on the track, on the swimming pool uh, every day. And now I am stuck behind a laptop, which is something that I, I, don't, handle, I don't handle very well. Uh, it's key to after one hour or so to stand up and do a little bit of work. If you can exercise, then uh, it's even better and go back to your, um, to, you go back to work because then it's proven that you, uh, you're more productive and therefore obviously that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll also, we also recommend to make some changes in the in the office environment, especially for those working from from home. And what we do is uh, we don't use chairs; we use uh, Swiss balls instead. So it it also helps you to uh, work on your core muscles while you are uh, sitting down. Actually, I'm now still sat on, a, on one of those. And if you have a space and, and room in your uh, in your office, then setting your bike with the turbo trainer will be also highly recommended. Just to jump on it. Do a little bit of, of easy spin. Um, leave all your devices away because if you keep engaged with the phone or with your email, then um, you might not get the same benefits that if you will do it if uh, you completely switch off. Okay. 
then uh, it's for those that never practice uh, running or jogging before we we have seen um, a 10 uh, i think it's worldwide where everybody uh, just competing and in running races because well it's fun it's engaging it's easy to do it's cheap and there are obviously many many health uh, benefits associated with with running but as we can see there on the screen. So it helps uh, building the strong bonds due to these impacts I mentioned before, uh, help us strengthening muscles, improve our cardiovascular fitness, and well, it's uh, obviously help us maintaining a healthy weight if we have a, a good nutrition. But before putting a pair of running shoes on and going out for running, there are a couple of things that uh, we should be in, in mind. And the first one, is, uh, and uh, I always do that with all the athletes I'm, I'm working with, is to see a doctor, ask for a checkup, and make sure that everything is, is good. Because um, obviously, if we start exercising and our heart, or we have any kind of uh, health problems, then the side effect of the consequences could be uh, detrimental. Then it's also a common mistake for um, the, the new people who comes into the sport to attempt, uh, attempt uh, long runs on, on the first training, on the first practice. And um, I obviously don't recommend that. I uh, would recommend starting with a, with a brisk walking and uh, combine it with, with running as uh, you practice it through the weeks. So there is... Uh, kind of far legs, which is a speed game uh, that can be easily done for those that are studying. And you can combine some minutes walking by some minutes running. And at the end of the day, what matters is how many times you are practicing uh, uh, exercise. So what, how many, the amount of time you are exercising. Okay. It's also good to do some kind of warm ups and stretch it and stretch it before you, you start uh, running because it kind of prepares the body and the head for what is coming, as well as cooling down. Um, we could be talking for hours about what kind of stretches you, you can do, if it's needed or it's not needed, but um, uh, obviously that could be something that you should do once uh, you start training in a more organized way. But make sure you, uh, you cool down properly. And for countries like Kuwait, especially in summertime, you need to intake a lot of uh, fluids and we know there are a lot of water stations all over the the places but if possible just bring your own uh, bottle with with you especially now with the COVID, so it's you don't want to catch it uh, by drinking from uh, one of these <laughs> water points okay um more doesn't necessarily means better especially in this kind of uh, of trainings and uh, to me, having the right equipment, obviously, is key because a lot of people go out and runs with uh, no appropriate shoes. That's the first thing, but also t-shirts and, and and shorts. So it's uh, it's key to seek for for a professional advice when it comes to okay, what kind of shoes you, you should wear because everybody lands in different ways, and what you don't want is to get injured. That's that's the last thing you wanna you wanna do. And to me, it's key. It is really, really important to add strength training into any kind of endurance training. Because no matter if you are swimming, running, or cycling, what you do is you repeat uh, the same movement. So you apply force against a resistance for a long period of time. So the more strength you have, the faster you'll go. And that's uh, really important when you are looking for, for not only for, for performance, but uh, also to, to be injury free. Because if, you're, if the body is not ready to, with, to withstand with the demands of, of running itself, with all the impacts that you are having against the flow, and uh, this is something key because, and, and it's important that people understand it. Every time you land on the floor, the, your joints, uh, we stand or have to support three times your body weight. So that's repeated over time. If all the muscles and all the structures are not ready enough, it will, it will break. So it will break and, and it will be shown in a way of injury. 
and obviously this is something you don't want to go to go through okay. and pretty much that was all from my side i would like to give the floor to to tom and leave some time for the q a and then, yeah just for those that will start exercising find your rhythm and especially enjoy enjoy your run thank you thank you very much for saying appreciate it that was a really nice talk uh, now we'll switch over to Tom, who will take us through um, high performance sports, uh, strength and conditioning and all that. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Osama. Can you um, see that okay? Uh, yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, Good evening, everybody, or good afternoon. Um, no, it's good night for you, isn't it? It's good evening for me. So I'm here in rainy Liverpool in the UK, as Osama said. Um, and it's an honour to be uh, asked to present for Serge Kuwait. It's something that I'm really interested in, in helping out with and explaining some of my experiences to you guys and you know, seeing what tips and tricks we can take from the pros, I suppose. So um, as Osama said, um, I did my PhD working with Liverpool FC, um, which was a great experience. And specifically, I was looking at strength training and how that can be implemented specifically in, in football. But beyond that, I've done a, a few other things, which I'll come on and talk about in a, in a second. So just to give you a little bit of background from, from me. I'm not really a footballer myself, to be honest. My, uh, my background is actually uh, track and field. Um, but what we're going to talk about specifically today is we're going to a little bit about me we're going to talk about how the professionals decide to do the kinds of training that, that they do um, and we're going to talk about what you should do so what lessons you can take from them and how you can implement something similar we're going to talk about how you can put those things together to form a session so as i said i was a track and field athlete this isn't me you can spot this is the best triple jumper in the world but this was what i wanted to do when i was about 17 years old before i realized that i was i wasn't able to do that that was my ambition. When I realized I couldn't do that, I thought I'd try and make other sportsmen, um, better sportsmen, I suppose, which is what I then went on to do. So how did I go about doing that? Well, very briefly, here's me working at Liverpool FC with one of their young players. Um, and this was at the end of my academic journey, I suppose. I started off with a BSc in Sport and Exercise Sciences, moved on to an MSc at um, Loughborough University, where I did exercise physiology. And then I finished off with that, that PhD, which I finished about five years ago now. I'll talk a little bit about some of my research a little bit further down the line. Um, in terms of the applied setting, um, I've done lots of different things. So here's me with some of the Liverpool FC staff in Melwood, which is where the first team trained until this week, actually. They've just moved out to a new multi-million pound setting. Um, but along the way, I've worked with university athletes, um, working with track and field athletes, rugby players, footballers, rowers, triathletes, all sorts of different things. I've worked in professional football, as I said, at Liverpool and at another club before that, uh, Coventry City Football Club, who are a championship team not far away from where I live. Um, I worked commercially as a, as a nutritionist, helping some of the um, UK's top nutrition brands develop new products. So working as a scientist to help them understand what their products should include and why, and looking specifically at the ingredients, mainly around endurance sports and the kind of stuff that the sent does. And then I've had consultancy works um, roles working, as um, Osama said when he introduced me, with organisations such as Formula One, the NFL, um, Adidas, Puma, some really exciting stuff. So, yeah, I've, I've done a fair few things. Um, and I think what sort of sets, not sets me apart, but what makes me a little more unusual in what I do is that I've done two sides of my job. So here you can see me working as a, as a practitioner. And if there's any Liverpool fans out there, you can see Curtis Jones on the far left and... Uh, Reese Williams on the far right, who now play for the first team. This is them when they were quite a bit younger at a tournament out in Abu Dhabi. So I worked as a, as a practitioner. So on the field, like Vicent does as a coach, as a strength conditioning coach, working as a, a nutritionist and trying to make these guys better. But at the same time, I've also worked as a, a researcher, trying to be a, a mad scientist and trying to uh, make things happen and answer questions. And specifically, I was looking to improve the practices at Liverpool FC with the, uh, the young players and what they do. Um, in their day-to-day -day practices. Now, the question about what that means for you is, I heard this quote recently and I found it really interesting. So without data, it's just your opinion versus somebody else's. 
and you, you can read that and perhaps think that that's specifically talking about data, but I, I don't really mean that even, even for you guys sitting there, if perhaps you're looking to embark on, a, on an exercise journey or do something new, unless you're kind of measuring what it is that you're doing, you probably don't really know whether you're improving. And at a really basic level, that might just be, well, I currently weigh 90 kilos and I'd like to weigh 85 kilos. Well, you'll need that data to work out whether you're, you're losing weight. So on the, the applied setting, working in elite sport, we would consider that a needs analysis. So if I was doing a needs analysis on a player, I might consider what it is that they need to be better at. I might then implement an intervention with them and I'll re-measure them and see if, if they're improving. And I think that's worth keeping in mind for you guys as well, you know, whatever it is you're trying to do. And some things are easier than others. If you want to be a runner and you want to get your 10K time down or you want to work in the gym and bench press slightly more, you know, it's important to record these things, not in an obsessive way, but just to give us a bit of information about whether it's, whether it's working or not. And from, from when I worked at Liverpool and when I've been involved in other clubs and other organisations along the way, it's always a bit of a, a bit of a balancing act. And, you know, we need a balanced approach between the, the science and the research, I suppose, because, you know, just because we might read or I might read a research paper that might tell me that I need to um, train in a certain way, that might not always be realistic in the sporting setting so I can't go to Jurgen Klopp and say you need to make sure that you're training like this because this paper says this is the best way to do it because if they've got three games that week then it's very challenging then for for them to be able to take that information on board and to use it and I think that the similar approach is, is the case for us as well we have to take realism into consideration so when I was younger, I'd read things like men's health and things like that about how I should be training better so I could be a better triple jumper, a better track athlete. But, you know, maybe I wasn't able to do exactly what those sessions were saying. And I think sometimes we get a little bit put off by that if we're trying to implement change in our lives around our exercise regimes. You know, if we're if we have busy working schedules or like Vicent was saying, we know that Kuwait has you know limitations in how easy it is to do things. I was actually over in Kuwait last August um, presenting, Osama invited me over to present at an event and it was a fantastic um, experience. I really, really enjoyed it. It's my favorite country I've been to in the Gulf, but I'll never forget walking out of the airport at seven o'clock in the morning, it was 47 degrees. Now at seven o'clock in the morning, if it's like that, I'm not gonna wanna go outside for a run in my lunch break. And uh, Vicente was right, you know, it's about finding the right way to do these things and finding appropriate places and that, and that kind of thing. So we, we need to take that balanced approach. And probably the resounding theme of my talk here is going to be that it's going to be, you know, not being too hard on ourselves and, and being realistic in what we're doing. But when I worked in the clubs, I, I was trying to do that as best I can. I was trying to take the research and I was trying to inform practice in a in a kind of practical, usable way. And what we've got coming here is just a, a short, not this one, sorry, this one. So um well, where are we going? I'm lost now. This one, in fact, excuse me. So what we've got here is, is two people from two different worlds, a scientist and a, um, and a researcher, I suppose. And, you know, they're saying, I'm right. And the other one's saying, no, no, I'm right. And I, I think that's what I experienced a lot when I was working in elite sport, where you would try and give people information and perhaps they didn't want to hear it because they thought they knew better. And again, I think this is, you know, the take home from you guys here is sort of people in the real world, like we all are, is... I might want to be doing things perfectly, but that can be quite challenging. So if I'm doing it to the best of my abilities and the best way that fits in with my day to day, then, then that certainly is the best way that we can do it. So if we can consider now how professionals train and, and, and what a typical week looks like um, in, the, in the elite world, and, and then we'll go on to talk about what lessons we can take from that. We consider for, for football, and I'm sure whatever sport it is that we're interested in, we can think of the sort of alternative versions. They would obviously do a lot of soccer specific pitch based training. So that would be, you know, anything with the ball, really. The stuff that I'm probably a bit more interested in is the non soccer specific stuff. So typically this would be stuff based in the gym. But more and more now footballers are doing things like yoga and swimming and stuff like that just to vary their training. They would play matches as well. So SSG stands for small sided games. So that might be if they're doing not an 11 v 11 on a big pitch, but maybe a small three versus three or five a side. And then obviously the actual matches that they play is a, a pretty serious training stimulus, even though it's not part of their training, it's you know part of their actual matches. 
They then have recovery sessions, which are incredibly important. And, and I'll talk about why that is in a moment of recovery is something which is, I think is often overlooked, especially when we become a bit more keen to get out there and implement a new training regime, because we really just want to go and work really, really hard. But we'll talk about why that might not be the best way. And then something I'm incredibly um, passionate about, and I'm glad that Vicent mentioned it, was resistance training. You know, this is something which often for a variety of reasons people might shy away from. Some people love it, some people want to go in the gym, but if you are a triathlete perhaps, or if you are a, a runner, or, or if you're a bit intimidated to go in gym environment, you might not want to do that. But I think it's something which is, which is quite important. Now, how does this all matter to, to you, you know, what, what can you take from that? I mean, you're not professional footballers, none of us are. The thing I think is important to spot here is that if you look at what these training sessions are, they give us aerobic adaptations, which Vicent explained really brilliantly a minute ago. They give us anaerobic adaptations, which is kind of the faster stuff, and hopefully some, um, some strength training adaptations as well. So really they're kind of ticking all of the boxes just in a football specific way. And that's what I would encourage everyone to do really, not to just do one thing. Now, if you only wanna do one thing, if you only want to go out and run four days a week every week and you hate everything else, then that would certainly be better than staying on the sofa. But I think if we wanna be well-rounded for lots of the reasons that Vicent mentioned earlier about bone mineral health and everything else, then you know it's good for us to do a little bit of everything. Now, this is a, a slide that I, I quite like actually. So do I have to exercise? And I think the reason that I've put exercise in quotation marks there, I think is because when we sometimes think about exercise, we think about what this, this lady's doing here. So it's being out for a run. And for some people that's heaven. And for some people it's, it's hell. And, but I agree with the centre, you know, it's fantastic. All you really need is the right pair of running shoes and ideally somewhere that's not 47 degrees C and you can, and you can go outside and do it. But some people really wouldn't want to do that. Um, and I think, you know, an excellent training stimulus, if you don't like conventional exercise, like just running or even going to the gym is, is to consider is to consider sport, you know, and here's, here's just one research article that I want to quickly show you that looked at how playing football for health markers was, was um, really useful. So this paper looked at um, people's resting heart rates, people's cholesterol, their blood pressure, their VO2 max, so their fitness and their fat mass. And all of those things improved over a period of 12 weeks from just playing football. The key was that they had to play at a decent intensity. They had to get the heart rate pump in. But ideally, you kind of do that because if you're playing football, you probably like it and you're probably a little bit competitive and, you know, you're, you'd naturally get your heart rate up. And we can see here, you know, it doesn't matter if you necessarily understand what these graphs show, but what they are showing is a decrease in, in fat percentage over, over 12 and then 64 weeks. Now, I'm not saying that reducing your body fat is the be all and end all, but it might be something that you're interested in. And obviously there's lots of links to having a lower fat percentage and lots of health markers. So it might be something that's, that's quite important. As I said, I, I think it's especially important not to shy away from, from strength training, whether that's for health performance or, sorry, whether that's for health or for all sport performance, in fact. You know, from the elite setting now, we're seeing strength training implemented right across sports. Sports like swimming, for example, which some will attest to, I'm sure. They didn't do a lot of strength training in the old days, but, you know, these guys are looking for propulsion. They need strong shoulders. They need strong legs. Um, I work with um, a couple of triathletes, some based in Kuwait, actually, and, and primarily looking at implementing strength training in what they do. And, you know, you might think, well, why, why would you need to do that? But eventually you will, you will get a reduced return from your endurance training. You know, you might, if you run and swam and cycled the same amount for kind of five years, you might be reaching a plateau. You get that law of diminishing returns. And it's power that's unique that you need to sort of take you to the next level. And this addition of strength training or resistance training is something that can really do that. And there's some really interesting studies out there um, in triathlon, actually, where they show that you can actually reduce the volume of triathlon training that you're doing by 20%. So if you take your cycling and your running and your swimming and you reduce that down by 20%, but you implement a strength training component, then you actually see improvements in your triathlon performance. So 
potentially you can reduce your training overall and still get better. And it's not just about improvements. You know, I was really pleased that Vicent mentioned the reduction of injury risk, and that's that's so important, but not only for sports performance, you know, as we age, our bone mineral density begins to decrease, especially in women. And, and it's something that's that's really important, although it's something that perhaps we don't think about quite as much. But back to the professionals. So, so what is it that they do? How do they put it all together? Well, they want to move towards achieving specific goals. And as I spoke about doing things like a needs analysis will will help them to do that. They're going to make small changes to make big differences. And, and that's the other thing that I, that I would like to, to mention. I think, you know, sometimes we feel like we can't do what we need to do to get where we need to get to. But it's that old, you know, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And, and it's so true. You know, we just need to be making small additions to the amount of movement that we have to bring about some big changes, whether that's in health or in or in performance. And ultimately, we're looking for consistent, maintainable change to your regime. So I mentioned nutrition here briefly as well. And I was going to talk a little bit about nutrition. As I say, I do have a bit of a background in it, but I'm not going to. I'm going to tell you to come back to the nutrition lecture here in a couple of weeks time. So when I was in Kuwait last year, one of the ladies who's presenting it, I saw speak and she knows more about nutrition than I'll ever know. So I won't do her a disservice. So come and watch that. It'll be it'll be absolutely fantastic. Um, so how do we plan it? That's the question. Well, if it's soccer, we, we might plan it in one of these two ways. If we, so where you can see the ball where it says GD for game day, that might be how we plan our training. So minus six to minus one is how many days before the game. So you might do it like the green boxes where you might have the day off after a game, come in for a little bit of training, have another day off, and then you train the three days up to a game. Or you might do it like the blue boxes where you have the day off after a game, you come in for a recovery day and then you train all the way up to the game. And there's a few different ways of doing it. But the point here is me showing you how you can plan your training around what it is that you're doing. And it might be a competition, you might be a 5k runner or a triathlete or you might like playing football and you might tailor your training around when you're performing. Or it might just be for you to see that some days you need to be trained a little bit harder, some days you need to train a little bit easier, some days you, you shouldn't be training at all. But how do, what does that mean for you? How do we do that? Well, we need to be working at appropriate intensities and for an appropriate amount of time. I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. We need to consider that recovery or low sessions or I rest sessions. And it, it really annoys me, if I'm honest, when I see sometimes on Instagram, you'll see sort of hashtag no days off. Well, your days off are really important. It doesn't make you any better than anyone else to be training every single day. If anything, you're just going to end up getting injured. I mean, you can, I suppose you could train every single day, but I would certainly want some days to be very little training at all because you need that recovery time. You need that time for adaptation. And I'm going to talk about what that means in a moment. We need to incorporate that resistance training. And I know I keep on saying that, but I really believe it. And it's not just lifting big weights. It's not something that we need to be going in, throwing heavy dumbbells around when, you know, making ourselves feel uncomfortable. And for anyone who's ever tried to do a pull up, you know, you don't need any weight at all, more than your body weight to get a decent resistance training workout. But that's the big one for me, make it fun. You know, if you love cycling, go cycling. If you love, maybe you do love going in the gym. I quite like going in the gym. So that would be part of my regime, but find what works for you. Find out how many days you like doing it. Mix it up a bit, do some aerobic stuff, some faster stuff, do some resistance training somehow. And we'll talk about that in a moment, but just make sure it's fun or you just won't stick with it. And then that's useless. So the main man, here he is. How do we do that? Well, what we need to be thinking is we need to be manipulating a few key variables. So how long we're training for, how hard that training is and how often it is. And if we look at that scientifically, this graph kind of explains what's going on. So on the bottom, we've got sessions over time and on the going upwards, going vertically, we've got our performance. Now in an ideal world, we would just kind of train harder every day and we just get fitter or every session, we just get better and better and better. However, if you, if you try to do this over time, our performance level will actually go up certainly, but then we'll come down and we call that overtraining. And that's why I was talking about that, why I hate that no days off. It's, it's just incorrect, frankly. And, and why is that? Well, 
this is normal. This is what we call our homeostasis. And then when we train, we get this response. So this is when we train here where that stimulus is. And then we see our fatigue. So if I went and run a 10K today, because I don't do loads of running, I'd certainly be fatigued the next day. But ultimately, I would compensate to the point where I super compensate, which is now above the line where I started. Ultimately, I got fitter at that thing that I was trying to do. If I then never run again, eventually that line will involve, it will go down until I'm back to where I was before, which isn't very helpful. So how do we stop that? How do we and how do we maximize based on that? Well, we need to balance that overload and our regeneration. So that doesn't mean doing loads and loads and loads, but it means doing enough. We need to prevent monotony, which is something again that Vicent mentioned, which is really important because if we just do boring stuff or the same stuff all the time, it will always become boring. So we need to change it up. And we need to avoid that accumulation of stress to the point where we have done too much, like I just showed in that overtraining slide. Now, what does that look like? Well, if we take strength as our variable of choice, because it's what I'm quite interested in, if this is our training bout here, and we see that curve that I just explained, if we train again when we're at the top of that curve, when we've had our adaptation, when we will continue to see an upturn in our performance, and that would be our optimal training. Conversely, if we train when we haven't allowed sufficient adaptation, then we see our line goes down when we're overtraining because we're not allowing that recovery time, which is why recovery and rest days are so important. However, and sometimes I definitely have done this, we might train because we feel we feel like we want to train. And then we wait a little bit because we feel like we've already trained and we can just rest for a few days now. Um, and we end up getting under training because we're not having enough stress accumulated over time. And that's not what we want. So it's that top one that, that we want. That's something to keep in mind. I think that it's, it's that back to that balancing act. And then if we remember that, that slide where I showed you where we don't have our days off and we just kill ourselves every day and it looks like this. Well, if we keep these training principles in mind, then hopefully where we have our rest days, we see that overall we do see continued improvement, which is exactly what we want. So that's something for us to think about when we're putting our regimes together. Most new improvements in performance will come. Now, no lecture would be complete without somebody mentioning COVID, um, unfortunately, but I think it's worth mentioning just quickly. So how can we exercise in relation to COVID? I mean, this is certainly isn't an area of expertise for me, So I um, but I will just touch over some basics. So excuse me if it's too simple, but I'm not a medical doctor. So we need to exercise carefully. You know, we need to socially distance where we can, keep our hand sanitizer close, exercise outdoors where it's possible or at home perhaps. You know, and this could be really useful because because if we're looking to introduce weight training, for example, then we can just do that at home. We can go on YouTube and look up some home workouts, which is just using our body weights and things like that. And we can still have real positive adaptations. And then when the gyms are fully open again, we can go and take it to the next level, perhaps. But why would we want to do that? Well, um, we've Vicent mentioned the physical and the mental well-being, whether it's reducing stress, whether it's in endorphins, and you know, they're in, that's incredibly important for us. But we also um, need to think about if we're unfortunate enough to get COVID, we know that our recovery from the virus is vastly accelerated if we have a, a reduced BMI and if, if we're fitter. So, you know, it's a potentially very important time for us to consider our fitness at the moment. Similarly, there is some research out there to suggest that you may have greater resistance to the virus if you are fitter in the first place. Again, that's not something I'm an expert on, but it sounds like something that would be logical and a reason to stay fit and healthy, I think. So our, our take home messages from, from my session in terms of how we can plan our training, what the professionals do and, and what's important to us. We need to consider that progressive overload, but in an appropriate way that isn't too much. So we look for simple increases over time. I would um, encourage you all to consider the addition of resistance training, but it doesn't have to necessarily be weight training. It's just something that puts a stress on your muscles beyond more sort of general aerobic training. And then most importantly, come back for that nutrition lecture because it's the other side of this continuum and it's equally important. And just to finish off, remember, if you only remember one thing when you're considering how to plan your training moving forwards, 
make sure you enjoy it otherwise you just won't stick to it i hope that's been interesting if you've got any questions i'd be pleased to hear them uh, my email and my twitter are at the bottom there if anyone's got any questions i'd be more than happy to answer them um but yes back to you osama thank you very much thank you tom for that really insightful uh talk. I have some questions here in the Q&A uh, that I'd like to ask you guys. Um, feel free, both of you, to answer. Uh, so our first question is, uh, how do you gain weight and improve strength exercises? Uh, I'm guessing through uh, strength exercises, how would you gain weight I think and improve your strength? That, that's more of uh, for, for Tom, this question. He's <laughs> more expert in the strength training than, than myself. I'll start off, but you can add to it, Vicente, yeah, if you have anything else. Um, increasing weight um, is interesting. Um, mainly it's eating more, to be honest. It's, it's quite a simple calorie equations. It's how many calories going in, what you eat, how many calories going out by being alive and doing exercise. Um, and that will make you bigger. Presumably, you probably want to be getting bigger in the right kind of stuff. It's, it's muscle that you're seeking rather than, rather than fat, rather than adipose. Um, so doing the things that we've both spoken about training, especially resistance training, because resistance training especially increases our muscle size. But yes, primarily it's eating more. Yeah, nothing else to add in there, but uh, if, if I do believe the question when more through uh, gaining uh, muscle mass <laughs> rather than, uh, than uh, body fat. Uh, that definitely, it's also to do the right exercises for, for this purpose, because <clears throat> especially my experience working in a fitness club, they're in great. I've seen many unqualified PTs who are just um, working as a, I, I used to call them, towel handle, uh, because they are only, you know, hold, holders, sorry, towel holders. They are holding the towels and just telling people, uh, you know, to lift random things and uh, to do a certain number of exercise based on the direction of the wind. So it depends, you know, when they did 12, the day after they did, I don't know, 16, but there was not a proper training prescription and no testing or whatsoever. And I'm a huge fan of numbers too, because as, as Tom said, you cannot improve what you cannot measure. So then it's only, um, as I say, just giving random workouts for only God knows what purpose. Yeah, the other thing as well, just to finish that up, and that's a great point, Vicente. I agree totally with all that. But the one thing I'll add on is something that you mentioned in your talk actually, which is the importance of sleep, you know, hormonally, if we're not well rested, our cortisol levels will increase and that will always inhibit the building of muscle mass. So, you know, people who are interested in supplements and things like that, and some people spend an awful lot of money on supplements and you ask them how much they're sleeping and they'll tell you four or five hours a night and you think, well, you're wasting your money. You'd just be better off having two more hours sleep. So, you know, something that I think is often overlooked. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, next question. What type of exercises would you recommend for women after birth or po postpartum to help with pelvic pain? The, um, based on my, my wife's experience uh, after she delivered, actually she did a trial on only three months after the, the, the birth of my, my daughter. And because she never stopped exercising while uh, when she was pregnant. But I would say um, something that, or some kind of exercises that doesn't have a huge impact, like uh, you know swimming or, or cycling, could be more recommended than, than running, uh, until all the muscles and all the, the area uh, is properly strengthened. But uh, it's really really important to do a rehab in the you know the, the pelvic floor because. Um, Obviously, I had suffered a, a huge stress after the uh, 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 the partum. So, yeah, but um, I would suggest anything that doesn't have a, a lot of impact, basically. Um, I don't really have anything to add, to be honest. That's not really my area of expertise. However, um, a colleague of mine published a book recently on it. I'll put a link in the chat. Asama, I don't know if you can share that with the panelists or if you can share that with people, but... Um, I've heard it's an excellent book about during and post-pregnancy about what to do, but not my area, I'm afraid. Perfect. Okay, I'll, I'll share with everyone. Thank you for that. 
Uh, our next question is, during COVID, do you recommend or can you wear a face mask while exercising outdoors? We did um, a lot of uh, research about the topic and actually it's, it's, there's nothing that opposes against you know, wearing the mask, uh, running or exercising outdoors. It's only the discomfort whether you can, uh, you can handle it or not. But there were a lot of, uh, of myths and misunderstanding, especially going on in Spain, we're saying, you know, you're gonna uh, inhale more C uh, CO2, um, whatever. And that's, that's, that's not true. So it's only the way, whether you can handle it or not. Uh, if, uh, if it's you know, discomfort while you're using it or not. But um, you know, fitness wise or health wise, there is nothing published um, to the best of my knowledge, that doesn't recommend exercising with, uh, with, the, you know, with the use of a mask. I agree wholeheartedly. Yes, I've seen nothing to say that you shouldn't do it. I, I do dare say that if you are outside away from others, it's probably not necessary. However, if you do run with a friend or run in a park where there might be a few people running and we know that respiration is increased when everyone's running and it makes you feel more comfortable, then go for it. I probably think you don't, you might not need it if you're in a nice open area, but it certainly won't inhibit your breathing or your oxygen saturation levels of your blood or anything that you crazy stuff you might read on the internet. No, so go for it. No, that's good to know because I, I think a lot of people here uh, have that ex ex expect that because they're outdoors or something, it's fine to just not wear a mask and you won't get COVID if you're working out outdoors, even if you're in close proximity. But I guess uh, research says otherwise. No, I think it is far less likely outside, but it depends how you're exercising outside, doesn't it? Yeah. There is a, a paper um, that um, I think assesses the distance you should be uh, running, you know, versus or away from other runners in order not to uh, to catch COVID in case. Uh, and it was like a meter and a half, something like that. But it depends on many other factors, like uh, the, the direction of the wind, if you are behind sideways. So it, yeah, it's better not to be close to anyone. Uh, it's not the best time for uh, you know, running uh, additional risk. So it's, it's better to be on the safe side rather than um, the hospital bed. So. Yeah. <laughs> Next question I have here is, what protocol is suitable for strength training? Uh, they've named a couple, so they've, they've named uh, Delormis, McQueen, or Oxford. I don't know. I'd have, do you guys know any of them? Or I'm, I'm happy to say that as a doctor of strength training, I don't know any of them. Maybe I should hand in my PhD. Um, so I'm afraid I can't answer that specifically. If, if you're brand new to it, I always favor a kind of moderate intensity, moderate volume approach. I mean, people hate people those towel holders in the gym would always shy away from three sets of 10 because it probably doesn't sound very cool. But to be honest, I think three sets of 10 is not a bad place to start. I would start off with exercises which involve more than one joint. So a bicep curl is only one joint, but a pull up is two joints. Anything which is two joints is always a good place to start. Three sets of 10, when you get into your final rep, you should be working hard enough that you could only do one or two more. Don't do it two days in a row make sure you're well rested, stay away from other people at the moment. Uh, aside from that, I'm afraid I don't know those protocols. But if somebody um, who asked that wants to email me and ask me again, I'll happily look at the three of them and, um, and give my opinion on them. I don't know, sent, you, perhaps you've heard of them. No, unfortunately, I, I haven't. And I'd, this is something that I'm also experiencing with, the, with some of the courses we are delivering for the World Trial. And whereas a lot of the most of the times um, we are forgetting or a lot of coaches are forgetting about the, the fundamentals and the fundamentals work. And uh, I have the feeling, especially in the Middle East, the, due to the lack of professionals working on the field. And I'm not afraid to say that because I work there and I know who, uh, you know, the majority of the professionals who are uh, actually in gyms and, and uh, working in fitness centers, they tend to overcomplicate things and to bring like you know terms and 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 protocols and strategies that 
when I heard them, I, I experienced the same thing that you like, okay, I should go back to the uni perhaps because I'm, <laughs> I'm still researching, I'm still reading, I never heard about them. So um, the more fancy names or the more fancy protocols doesn't necessarily mean are, are the best. So I would recommend what, uh, what I'm just uh, mentioned, just to focus first on the fundamentals because we all know based on the research that they work and as you get better and the stimulus that you are going through doesn't cause any effect to search for another ways of, of, of training. But um, uh, you mentioned also about nutritionist, uh, nutrition, sorry. And there was, um, I used to work in Corniche and there were people there spending over 600 euros per month in pills, like uh, 50 pills. There's a uh, I'm not going to make advertisement of this brand, but uh, they claim that uh, this brand claims that uh, the products nowadays doesn't, doesn't have the, um, the right nutrients and our body also is not ready to extract all those nu uh, nutrients from the food. So by giving all the isolate nutrients, our body gets, uh, you know, um, it, it kind of re-educate itself. But okay. Um, yeah, but also your pocket is, <laughs> is being affected by this kind of a strategy. So um, going back to what I said, fundamentals work, the basic things work, so do not overcomplicate it because even in high performance, I'm also involved with the with high performance, sometimes the basic is what, what works the best. And, and I, I don't know if Tom will agree or he's doing so I don't believe he, he agrees on what I'm saying, but it's just a matter of, of uh, Understanding the whys. So, and if, if we haven't heard anything about those protocols, you should question, you know, why uh, you want to do that one. I, I think as well, um, you know, I, I couldn't agree more with that. And I, I think often, I, mean, I recently started working with a with a triathlete in Kuwait, and and I said to he wasn't looking for any of these amazing magic potions, which is fantastic. But I did say to him, I said, I, I warn you, the stuff I'm going to ask you to do is is really simple because the simple stuff works. It really does. And, you know, give me give me a few months and we'll see what happens in your triathlon times. And, you know, I think you'll be pleased. And I remember a short story when I was working at Liverpool, I was asked to write four different training programs. Someone needed to improve their heading. Someone needed to improve their agility. Someone needed to improve their acceleration and someone needed to stop getting injured so much. Um, and I wrote the programs and my boss came to me a few weeks later and said, I've looked at those programs and they're all the same. And I said, yeah, they are all the same because None of them, these are younger players, by the way, not first team. None of them have really done strength training before. So they need to build that base of the pyramid. You know, you're talking about the icing on top of the cake. They haven't even made the cake batter yet. You know, it's, it's a simple start. So we, we've gone on a bit of a rant, a rant there, but I think we all agree. <laughs> Keep it simple. Keep it simple, exactly. Perfect. Our next question is, um, how can you do cardio and not lose the muscles? And how many hours do you think you should do of cardio to lose fat and not lose any muscles? Okay, this is a, actually it's a combination of everything. So if if you do a lot of uh, cardio without the strength, you obviously gonna lose uh, not necessarily muscle because you don't lose one or gain another, but you may lose strength. So th this is the funny thing about the sport. So if you don't exercise certain uh, capacities, you're gonna end up not losing them, but they'll be, they'll be affected in a negative way. Um, so it's the combination of the two. And nowadays, especially with, with triathlon, we are focusing a lot on strength training. And uh, Tom mentioned it, that we, we realized not uh, by doing less volume, but more strength and high intensity workouts, the results are, are better. So we're no longer doing a lot of mileage what, what we call it the trash uh, mileage, which is not bringing you any, any benefit. And uh, yeah, so it will be the combination of the two of them. And how many sessions? Uh, the, the second part of the question was? How many hours of cardio you should do to lose fat and not lose any muscles? Yeah, well, the, the fat they come, I mean, the, the, the exercise needed to start burning fat as a, as a main source of energy have to be low intensity for longer than 20, 25 minutes. That's, uh, I think, what's the, the, the limit? The, 
uh, the limit you can do. It depends on many factors, your, your sport background, your availability for training. So there's many, uh, it's not an easy question to give a number here. So, yeah. and it have to be, I cannot say now, you need 10 hours and all of a sudden, you know, you start doing 10 hours. It's a, it's a combination of, of intensity and, and volume, I would say. And that's why uh, cycling is a good exercise for losing weight because it allows you to exercise longer with uh, low intensity and therefore using fat as a main so source of energy, but have to be a controlled exercise. And the other thing I'd say on that, to go slightly deeper into the science, but not too much, your body's kind of got two different chemical systems working, your kind of aerobic fitness system and your kind of muscle system. Um, and when you, that only really one of them can be working primarily at any one time. So if you've got a luxury of being able to space out two sessions, then that's quite good. So if you can go for a run before you go to work, then you get all the benefits after that run until maybe you do your weights in the evening. And then you get the kind of strength benefits when those chemical systems change. If you really have to do those two sessions together, typically it's whatever you do at the end of the session where that system kind of works a bit more, if that makes sense. So if you have to do that, then it can be useful for you to sort of change over the orders. So one day you might do your run, then go straight in the gym. And the next day you might go in the gym and then go straight on your run so that your body at least has some time where one of the systems gets more time than the other. That's a little bit more elite though. So if, if you're a bit more just recreational, then I wouldn't worry about it too much. And I'd agree with everything else that the sense said. And in addition, I would like to add, going back to the strength, the more muscle you develop, the more energy you'll, you'll be using to be alive. <laughs> and this energy comes from fat. So yeah. And uh, developing muscle doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna you know, grow uh, muscle mass. So it's a matter of doing the right thing and be, uh, be strong. And we have a, a triathlete whose weight is uh, 61 and he can lift in the squat six times, uh, sorry, three times his, sorry, uh, no, no, three times his, his body weight in a single squat. So, and he's really, really lean if you see him. But it's and, and finally, finally, as well, if you think about the, those, the triathlon disciplines, you can do different kinds of sessions, either on the bike or in the pool, especially where you can almost do gym sessions. You know, if you do heavy efforts in a high gear on your bike, then you get strength gains on the bike, certainly not to the level that you were doing squatting and deadlifting, but if you're short on time, you can do that. And similarly in the pool, if you have a float between your legs, I mean, swimmers have big shoulders and they're not in the gym that much, you know, so if you, you can be a bit creative and get the best of both worlds from the sessions as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. Next question. Uh, exercise uh, is a challenge in cold weather countries. Um, since gyms are not safe at the point at this point, what is your recommendations or thoughts on being active, even though this is going on? I feel like I should definitely take that first because I'm English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I coach to at least from Iceland. So <laughs> I have also an input for that, but you go first, Tom. I think I think it's difficult and I think you know hopefully wherever you are it isn't cold all of the time so like for me at the moment I know the next sort of two or three months are going to be not ideal and especially while the gyms are closed hopefully that is only a short-term thing I mean some people say that there's no such thing as bad weather just inappropriate clothing so maybe it's just going for that run and getting wet and making sure you're wearing the right clothes and then having a shower afterwards but I think we're seeing a rise in um, home workouts especially um, and the home circuit classes so you can get your heart rate up, up at home doing circuits or you can you know replace the gym by doing bodyweight exercises it depends on the equipment that you've got available it might be if you've got a bike maybe you can buy a trainer to put it you put your bike on it or maybe a cheap exercise bike resistance bands are another cheap way of doing things inside if you haven't got too much kit otherwise yeah maybe some good waterproofs but let's hear about Iceland well, uh, basically, all the athletes I like coaching in Iceland are doing a lot of indoor training, obviously. Some of them are still going out, and it's what you said. They have the right gears, and they just cop with the weather. Uh, the first time we went into lockdown, I have a four-year-old daughter, and I wanted to know her physical activity while being at home. So we have three floors. 
So what I did is I put uh, uh, one of these bands that track activity. And obviously, and I think Tom mentioned it before, we, uh, my wife and I study sports science, so we've been quite creative with her. So she, she managed, she's only four, and managed to uh, run or walk for 12 kilometers inside our, our place per day. And obviously you need to be you know, playing with her and doing some exercises, but if you have two steps, then you have a, a good area for training. If you have a, a elastic, elastic bands, or stretch course, you can also do that. So it's about being creative and yeah, just purchasing a little bit of equipment. It doesn't necessarily need to be a really expensive one, but, but uh, I will re uh, relay on creativity over uh, performance. So. I think I think as well it, it's really worth mentioning I don't know where the person who asked that question is based but I'd be really keen to tell people not to be too hard on themselves at the moment you know it's it's difficult my my exercise regime at home is I go to the gym four times a week maybe I would go outside for a run once a week at the moment I'm probably running outside three times a week and maybe one home workout a week because I don't really enjoy it as much as the gym am I going to be as fit and as strong as pre-lockdown no is it only a few weeks hopefully and you know it's you know we can don't be too hard on yourselves it's really hard at the moment if you unless you're a professional athlete in which case you have probably got some better kit and you can do it but yeah it's about doing what we're able to do at the moment i think the person asking is in new york so if that changes any of your answers i don't know no. No, not so much no. No, I, mean, I know it's cool there at this time of year <laughs> no i don't think new york is worse than iceland so no. anyway uh, you know that, that's that's uh, really important to uh, emphasize or to define you know what what the, the meaning of cold is because to me 10 degrees is really cold in spain so there's no way i'm exercising outdoors with 10 degrees but uh, in iceland minus 10 is something that they can handle it so Perfect. Our next question is, does strength resistance training give the same physiological benefits as cardiovascular training, such as running or swimming? If so, how? It gives difference uh, because yeah. there are different uh, energy systems. So. Perfect. Okay. Yes, I agree. I think, I think you can get benefits. You can get crossover benefits. As I said, you can get, you can make your legs a lot stronger by pedaling hard on a bike and you can make yourself fitter by doing weights with not much of a rest period so yeah they're kind of a crossover continuance the uh, second part of the question is do supplements such as bcaa joint support supplements l-carnitine etc help or work and if any research you guys know about in that mm -hmm. sense um i'm a little bit more uh, conservative when it comes to supplements because i do believe um i'm sorry for the expression but if you don't need the supplements you will end up being money, so, so you don't necessarily need to intake uh, anything that your body doesn't need it. So to me, first, it's important to do a, a blood test and, and see you know, what, what, what did you need, so what you are lacking of, because if you don't like anything, then why should you be taking um, any kind of supplements? I also believe for uh, recreational athletes, yeah, there's a 10 of overusing supplements, over um, doing the, the right training. So I, I do believe if you have a, a balanced diet and you only exercise for an hour, an hour and a half per, per day, you don't necessarily need to take a lot of, of supplements uh, because everything can come from the food. A uh, different scenario is if you're a professional triathlete or a professional athlete who trains over eight hours per day and definitely, um, yeah, you might need something, but it's key to uh, identify or find out what you actually need in order to add the supplements. Otherwise, it's just a, an overload and a waste of money to me. So, but as I say, I'm more conservative when it comes to uh, nutrition and supplements. So I would like to hear from, from Tom. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, again, Samra, I put a link in the uh, chat, which I don't know if you can share that PDF with the, the, the participants here. It's about the Olympic International Olympic Committee's kind of statement on what they think is good and what they think isn't good. It's quite a short list of what they think is good, to be honest. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Vicent. You know, the athletes I work with, I kind of uh, lean towards a food first approach. I think you know, you should be able to hit, tick most of those boxes with whole foods and, and good choices. 
Some things do work. I mean, protein powders, for example, it is just milk. So, you know, it's kind of a food, really. It's, it's just a different format of taking it. A lot of the pills, I think, don't work so well. The, the evidence for BCAAs aren't great. What was the other one specifically that you asked about? Um, it was L-carnitine. Yeah, L-carnitine as well. I mean, you get it in meat. So again, it's food first. If you're eating enough of the thing, you know, if it doesn't fit in your diet, then maybe less so. But again, you know, I'm, we're back on the icing on top of the cake. And I wonder whether the person has made the cake batter yet. You know, if, if you're not having a good diet generally, then that would definitely be the right place to start, I think. Yeah. And uh, just, just to add on addition and coming back to my experience in the region, a lot of uh, people want just shortcuts and where there is a, a need or there is a, um, I would say, uh, uh, they're desperate to get results in like short periods of time. There is someone who sees business and business there is just by selling all uh, unnecessary things. So it's, uh, yeah. Coming up, uh, back to what I say about finding the right qualified uh, coach or, or personal trainer who will put your health first versus the money. Oh. That's true. Our next question is from a diabetes counselor from India. He's asking, uh, can you suggest the best exercises for diabetes patients, uh, male or female, uh, between the age of 30 to 50 for a healthier life? I have an experience working with uh, one Olympic tri um, athlete who is there, actually is diabetic, and there are not much differences between uh, you know, non-diabetics and diabetic athletes. The only thing we realize is they take longer to recover from uh, high intense exercises, but there is, there is much we do differently. And we also have a colleague who works for a professional cycling team, uh, Novo Nordisk, uh, someone knows her, Christina, and they, tr they train the cyclists as if they didn't have anything. The only thing they control is, as I said, after the intense session, they need uh, longer recoveries than cyclists who are not, so, uh, not, uh, who are not diabetic. So yeah, I wouldn't say you need to do many things differently. It's just very in mind that uh, they recovered properly and I, i'm i'm less experienced with dealing with diabetic athletes um Vicent kind of answered that i think towards type 1 diabetes i felt i don't know whether we don't know what we're talking about here but if it is a, a type 2 patient more than an athlete then i would lean towards what i spoke about in my lecture where it's you know if you're looking to get someone active then whatever gets them active is the right thing for them to be doing to help you know what's going on in their body be less impactful on their lives, I think. So it depends what it is we're talking about. Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, next one is, uh, how do you calculate the right amount of recommended increase in water intake per individual pre, during, and post-exercise? Good question. Um, it depends who you listen to. Um, my, my, my answer, um, there are some guidelines around hydration during exercise. They're quite broad. Um, and I tend not to like them too much, to be honest, because there's lots of variables to be taken into account. Um, before, um, I would drink enough to make sure that my urine is a pale straw color. You don't really need to drink much more than that, and that's different for everybody. The caveat is if you're taking a multivitamin, it might be a bit yellow or green anyway, but if you're not, then keep your pee a clear color. The jawing is enough so that you don't feel super thirsty. But again, it's challenging. It depends what you're doing. If you're out doing a marathon and you haven't got aid stations, that can be quite challenging. You know, they say around 150 mil every 30, 40 minutes, I think, something like that. But I think it's probably as much as, as you want. Um, and then afterwards, it's recommended that if you weigh yourself before and you weigh yourself after, the weight change is in kilos is the amount of liters that you've sweated out and you should aim to replace around 150 percent of that um, they would be my broad guidelines the during is challenging because everyone sweats differently and even the amount of liquid isn't representative of how much you sweat really because everyone has different amounts of salt in their sweat also if I go out and run 10K and it's raining in Liverpool and it's eight degrees, I probably don't need to drink nearly as much as if you guys go out for a run and it's 45 degrees. So before 
pale urine color during enough after 150% of your weight loss. That's what I think. I think I, nothing is to, to add, uh, especially because uh, the weather is, is really, really challenging in, in Kuwait. Uh, if whenever possible, just to add some electrolytes and um, salt tablets on, on the water because uh, the rate of, of sweat is extremely, extremely high. Even if you are on the bike and you might not feel it because the, the heat is keeping you dry. So you might not have the feeling that you are sweating a lot, but you actually are. So it's just to prevent that. We used to use these uh, stripes that measure the, you know, the, um, the pH and the, oh, I forgot the other ones, but, but um, a lot of athletes tend to end up with the dehydration because they don't drink enough. So it's, uh, it's, it's challenging. It's really challenging in the, in the region. I know it's an issue also with electrolytes, right? Cramping and suffering exercise. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is for Dr. Tom. So it says, hi, question for Dr. Brownlee. What's the difference between an off day and a recovery day? And which of the two do you incorporate more frequently into your programs? That's a great question. Um, an off day is when you do nothing um, at all. And a recovery day is when you do something, but it's very low intensity. So um, speaking, speaking about working with elite athletes where football clubs especially like to get their players to come in to work because they can be quite badly behaved when they don't come into work. So you might get them in just to keep an eye on them and you might get them to get on a spin bike for 20 minutes and it's a very slow spin. The idea is that it kind of flushes the body around a little bit and helps to get rid of some of the stuff that you've acquired during the, the training or the match the day before. You might do some training, you might, sorry, you might do some stretching, you might do a, a yoga session, um, you might do some steady swimming because you're buoyant in the water so you're not having the impact again on your legs um, but it depends what you like to do if, if you're fortunate enough to be a professional athlete you might have a massage which again helps to flush out some of those things in your muscles so yeah off is nothing recovery is very low and it depends what you've got access to as to what that might look like and the other part was do you which ones would do you normally incorporate into your programs do you do a mix of both or do you try to keep it really depends. I think, to be honest, if you are a, a, a normal person who wants to exercise and maybe you're a, like a recreational person who likes doing 10Ks, occasionally you might enter yourself into a race. I like off days because I think it's quite nice to not have anything to do. If, you, you know, probably on your off days, you're still going into work to do your nine to five. So it's not really an off day. I feel like low days are a bit more suited to those who are kind of semi-professional or professional because your whole life is just training and you probably still have an off day anyway. So if you're a normal person like me, um, an off day is great. If you're uh, doing it 24 seven, then have a low day. Perfect, thanks. Uh, Vicente, do you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, uh, just to, um, to uh, emphasize here, sometimes we, we don't have full full day of, uh, considered as, as such uh, or rest day I, I i meant so let's say if you finish your workout friday noon and then you start your next training on saturday noon that's 24 hours so that could be considered a one day despite the fact that from friday to saturday you haven't rest so it's uh, also the amount of hours you uh, you schedule from the last session to the next one could be used as a because if you finish friday noon and then your next session is Sunday noon. That's two days off. So it's not uh, 24 hours. Perfect. Okay, uh, next one. Uh, any idea about the correlation between exercise and the menstrual cycle? Uh, there is a myth that women should not exercise during their periods. Uh, yeah, well, actually it's a myth. Yeah, they can exercise, but they, you have to be extremely careful what you do while they're having the, the menstrual cycle. Actually, uh, for the endurance um, sports like triathlon, most of the training is prescribed and scheduled based on the menstrual cycle. So that's a necessary, it, it goes completely different uh, for males than, than, uh, than females when we're prescribing training and keeping a track on the menstrual cycle is, is key because there are certain periods where you don't want to run uh, a lot because the um, the hormones and everything that is going on in the woman body 
have or creates more um, flexibility in the joints and the risk of getting injured there by ankle sprains or, or any other injury is, is really, really high. So you don't want to do that. You want to avoid it. Same, you don't want to lift uh, like, you know, heavy weights because same, uh, you can get easily injured due to the flexibility of, of the joints uh, that they have in this, in this period. So um, I, I use a, an app, it's called uh, Clue. Uh, because you know it's a sensitive topic, especially in the Middle East. So they they add there the day the, the period just comes, and then I have a notification and change all the training if needed. But but definitely have to be taken into consideration first for the healthy reasons, and if your uh, your goal is performance, it's it's even more um, uh, more important to keep a track on that and prescribe the necessary training for for uh, for the yeah, the, this uh, the situation. I think um, I definitely agree with with all of that. There's some really good apps out there at the moment for tracking um, this kind of stuff, and the research that's being done at the moment is really taking this into account. So I think over the next couple of years, we'll all be so much better educated on how this fits in best. Um, the the one thing that Vicente said that I think is worth especially picking up on was he he said if you run a lot, and I think a lot of us don't exercise a lot a lot so, so i think if you are someone who is a normal person and does three days a week something then it probably doesn't really make loads of difference i think you probably wouldn't want to have a week off training every single month although we spoke about the ups and downs in training it probably would be the the more of a down week so i wouldn't shy away from it entirely at all but if you are a pro who's doing high mileage high volume in the gym then certainly you need to be aware of it for the reasons stated Cool. Thank you. Next one is, what is your recommendation for exercise for the elderly population? I'll go again for a lot of strength, <laughs> definitely, because it helps, um, well, uh, it helps preventing the loss of, uh, of muscle mass, as well as uh, helps on the balance and, and uh, definitely keep them healthier. And at the end of the day, it's a combination of everything. So if you know, when you, when you get older, you want to have fun and you want to enjoy. So you don't want to do something that you're not uh, enjoying it at all. So I've, I do believe, um, although I'm so much into triathlon, I practice all kinds of sports, different sports, no matter if it's, you know, uh, anything that uh, I have an opportunity to practice, I do it because I like to have fun. So I think for, you know, uh, strength should be, uh, should be a priority. And secondly, anything that just, you know, brings them fun and, and enjoyment. I think that that perfectly covers it. It's it's it depends on the age. You know, if we're talking about fifty year olds, then you can probably be pushed a bit further. If you're talking about ninety year olds, then it's anything. I think certainly once you get past 60, especially in women's strength, is so important. The bone mineral density decreases, the testosterone or the strength the strength hormones decrease so much but largely they probably want to do it a bit less especially when we get in our 70s 80s 90s so yeah anything whatever gets them moving if they enjoy doing it you know go out dancing do whatever it is you want to do if, you know my granddad's 93 i make sure he like stands up and sits down out of his chair like a few times a day it's probably going to help him being able to get out of his chair on his own you know if you stand there saying have you done your program yet and did you do all of the exercises you know, he might be less likely to continue it, I guess. Definitely. But I, I like to also properly define what we mean by, by strength. So strength is not only lifting weights, because there's a huge misconception about that. When you mention the word strength, uh, people you know, just picture themselves in the gym, just, just lifting. And uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be that. There are many ways of developing strength in, in, in many ways. So it's, uh, it's only about... Yeah, making sure you you have the right <laughs> the right uh, coach perfect thank you for that um when should an athlete consider changing coaches or training programs <laughs> okay that's a, a tricky one uh, mm -hmm. okay to me is when uh, yeah, your goals as long as they are realistic and are, are not achieved because, okay, yeah, I can dream for the Olympics, but I know I'm not cut for, for the, the Olympics. So I could be changing coaches 
if they don't take me to the games and that's not realistic. Okay? But I, I think I, first thing I'll go for professionalism and, and whoever I'm putting my health in the hands of, because at the end, this is what we're doing. When we are coaching someone, we are getting them sick in a, in a kind of way and then they get better and, uh, and they, you know, it's, it's, so I will go for this way first, like people who is qualified and know what they are doing. And if uh, they're not helping me achieving my goals, then I'll consider you know, to make a move, but yeah, that's my approach. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Um, if, if, it, if it's working, never. Um, if you feel that you're not, it's not working personally or, you know, so like the sense said, you know, if you're not getting what you want out of it and it's realistic, then that's not ideal. In terms of training programs, hopefully your coach knows how, how often you should be changing your program. But the broad answer to that is the more of a beginner you are, the less often you need to change your training program. So it's another thing, a bit like the super fancy exercises and the supplements. You know, sometimes people think, well, I've been doing this for three weeks. You know, a total beginner could probably do exactly the same thing for 12 weeks and it wouldn't be a problem. But people think that they might not be getting 100% out of it. You know, so that would be my answer for that part of it. Next one is, would you recommend aqua therapy in strength training protocols? I don't exactly know what that means. Yeah. I need uh, for the, uh, to elaborate this a little bit more. Aqua therapy, what do you mean like... Uh, exercising with the with the aqua bikes or, or things like that or as a recovery method um well i'll ask the person that asked yeah. and get back to this. we'll just move on to the next okay. one yeah um do you take into consideration fitt principles when prescribing exercise so frequency intensity time and type <laughs> yes <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that's important. I mean, they're the things I spoke about. It's uh, you know, it's the needs analysis. Why are you doing what you're doing? How often are you doing it? Um, what kind of stuff are you doing? I mean, again, that's probably more important for athletes, I think, than general recreational exercise. But yeah, it's really important. Even if for a psychological point of view, you need things to change and you need to be doing the right stuff or you won't be getting what you want out of it. So yeah, it's a good, simple rule to follow for sure. Okay. Um, how does one determine how many rest days are needed and when to schedule them? Good question. Yeah. I, if, if I can take this one, uh, I do believe it depends on the amount of training load. Because, okay, there, there are different approaches here. So if you are a recreational athlete, then uh, it wouldn't affect much whether you are taking one extra day uh, off or not. Uh, for professional athletes, it depends on how many training load they can take without getting injured. Uh, so it, 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 we don't follow the same rule, whether it's like 10 days training, one day off, or because we are continuously tracking the um, fitness level. So there are days where the numbers are not right and you just need to, to slow down and you change everything because actually what we do is uh, I do believe in the professional football it's pretty much happening the same. You test them in the morning and based on how they are, uh, you prescribe the, the necessary training for that day. But we are talking about high performance, which is you know, something really, really unique because the salary actually hits, uh, depends on the, the fitness level. For recreational athletes, I mean, personally, if I have a training schedule, but I got a call and there is a, a better plan, so I... I don't have any regrets to join a social event and just leave my, my training aside because the benefits I'm going to get are going to be perhaps uh, the same or even better. So. I agree. Great answer. Yeah. All right. Uh, what's your take on flotation tanks or deprivation tanks for recovery? And do you know of any of the benefits of them? I know a little yeah, bit about easily. flotation tanks. I, um, I read a paper recently and it actually summarized the, the positive effects on certain brain waves leading to relaxation, which might aid sleep improvements. But what was really fascinating about that paper was that they summarized that they think that the benefits in relaxation come about because the people in them can't look at their phones. So they actually postulated that even just not having their phone for an hour might have actually been what was doing the benefit there. I've, I've actually tried it. I found it quite 
relaxing, quite enjoyable. There isn't loads of research on it. Much like anything, if you do it and you like it and you feel it works, that's great. Maybe it's just because you're not looking at your phone for a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. Same with the sun. Is no, it... I never try them, so I, oh. I don't have any experience with, with those. Uh, how much of the relaxation period would you recommend to avoid, to avoid DOMS, the delayed onset? Um... Um, DOMS, as you become better trained, you get less and less DOMS. Um, a, a broad rule would be don't train the same kind of muscle group or the same kind of activity two days in a row. You, you are unlikely to pick up injuries as a result of training on DOMS. You are more likely to perform less well training on DOMS. So if we take a really closed skill like a bench press, if I bench press on Monday and I haven't bench pressed for six weeks, I'm going to be really sore on Tuesday. If I train on Tuesday, I'm probably not going to tear my pec, but I probably won't be able to lift as much. On Wednesday, you're probably all right to train again, even though if you haven't done it for six weeks, you're probably quite sore. But once you get into a decent routine, as long as you're not doing big step ups, you actually see DOMS reducing quite a lot. So the simple rule in my mind is not on consecutive days, but generally once that training volume and familiarization is there, you shouldn't really see them quite as much anyway. Perfect. Um, I'm gonna connect these two questions because they're very similar. Uh, is there an I ideal time of day to exercise? And do you recommend exercising at the same time? Would I have different results exercising at different times of the day? I think. Do you want to take this percent? Uh, yeah, I can start with it. Um, obviously, the longer the better. So if you only have uh, 20 minutes available, so then go for 20 minutes because it's, uh, it's going to be better than, than nothing. Uh, obviously, if you want to lose weight by doing aerobic exercise and you only go for 20 minutes, you are not likely to, to get you know, a lot of benefits because it needs longer uh, durations of, uh, of this kind of exercises. But if instead you do a high intensity workout or you do a strength training, then you may get all the benefits. So it, it definitely depends on uh, how much time available you have. But I also uh, I truly believe if you restructure the way um, you handle your day. And I, I'm gonna elaborate this a little bit more. So I take my daughter with my bike to the school. So I go to the school with the bike, come back home, I go and pick her up and come back home. And that's an hour 15 every day on my bike. So if I, do, I don't do anything else for the rest of the day, I already done an hour and 15 or an hour and a half. So instead of taking the lift, if you go upstairs, then you are adding more time. So it's kind of changing a little bit the, the, the behavior and, and you know, what you do every single day. But definitely the longer, the better. So the more time you, you can exercise, um, yeah, it will be the better. So, but. Did, did you mean as well when in the day? Second? Oh, sorry, Osama, did you, did you also mean yeah. at what time? Uh, is it best to train in the morning and night? I know you, Tom, you kind of mentioned doing a spacing between the two types. No, I think, I think the answer to that is linked into what the sun said for, for recreational people. It's when you can do it. Yeah. I mean, I think you'd be crazy again, you know, thinking about the sleep thing. If you have to be at work at seven, but you really want to train and you feel you need to do it at 5 a.m. So you're only getting four hours sleep. Don't do that. <laughs> um, no, there isn't really any evidence in it. The more evidence for everyone's rhythm is that we're kind of set up differently to each other anyway. So everyone's probably got their own optimal time. Strength training, it seems like the afternoon's probably better because your body temperature's a bit higher, which is better for it. But I wouldn't worry about those kinds of details if you're just a recreational person. Like the sense says, get it in when you can get it in. That's it. Perfect. A last question. Um, for busy people, what is the minimum duration of exercise to keep us healthy? There is no minimum, yeah. genuinely. There is no minimum. If, if I had the busiest day of my, the busiest week of my life, I probably wouldn't do any exercise. But if I really needed to, I would try and fit in three 15 minute body weight circuits where I went pretty intense. You know, I've just picked 15 minutes out of the air. Five minutes would obviously be better than zero minutes, but no, don't be hard on yourselves. 
do it where you can, like the sense says, run up the stairs instead of getting the elevator, park a few more spaces away at work so you have to do a little bit more working, walking. Don't get tricked into it's not worth it. It's all worth it if you really can't do too much, in my opinion. Exactly. And just coming back to what happened to us during the lockdown. So my daughter at home uh, managed to, to squeeze 12 kilometers. So <laughs> only, you know, she's only four. So it's uh, only a matter of changing small habits and then you, you get uh, more active and therefore uh, healthier. So, but uh, in a total agreement with Tom, do not be hard on yourself if you cannot do what, what you have planned because sometimes it's not under your control but yeah the more you can just be active and 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 do anything so the better so there is no minimum i agree with that perfect thank you uh that ends our questions for tonight um with your permission tom and vicent i uh, will possibly share your emails or contact information with um uh, more likely emails with any of the par participants tonight who might have questions or might want to venture into some of the sports you guys are talking about and I know you guys are doing some programs and different things. So maybe people can start um, getting into these sports correctly with the right uh, direction and all that stuff. Uh, thank you guys for tonight. Both very insightful. Thank you for sticking around. I know we had so many questions uh, tonight, which is really cool. Uh, but thank you guys for sticking around for that. And thank you to everyone who stuck around both lecture and that. Um, again, I want to thank everyone for attending. And also uh, in the chat, you can find uh, the link that Tom sent. I sent it to everyone, and we also um, included the link for next week's. Uh, you can find the QR code for next week's talk as well. You can just open your cameras, and uh, it will lead you to next week's registration. Uh, just to remind you, next week will also be on Sunday, 22nd of November. It will also be at 8 p.m. It will be with Dr. Salman Sabah and Nico Stempel, who uh, I guess is here as well, so shout out to Nico. Um, Nico and Dr. Salman will talk both about um, ergonomics and um, different ways where you can actually come up with different techniques to become injury proof or become stronger uh, in your workplace and in life itself. So thank you to everyone. Uh, we'll keep the QR code up. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can reach out to Serge Kuwait or any of us um, to get uh, contact details for Vicenna and Tom. Again, thank you to Tom and Vicenna and to everyone that attended. Uh, we'll see you next week, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you very much.